All right. Online participants. How many are online? 22. Okay, now it makes sense. It's okay. It's not even crowded. But Charlie, watching the ball on TV and being at the stadium, if you know, you know. Charlie, if you have been to the stadium, you know how I mean it. Uh, all right. Um, so this morning you had, uh, what's that? Land. Okay, how did that also go? Good? All right. So this afternoon, you know who's coming? Uh, you have seen the name already. I'm sure the slide is even, okay. So building regulations and the uh, building code, uh, the regulations and the code. And to do that for us is architect Dr. Justice Ofenketia, uh, who is into private practice and also teaches at the Sunyai Technical University. So I asked him, how did you come? And so I came by air. I said, ah, Sunyani too. <laughs> so sure, you don't know, passion and our yeah, future in life. So all the way from Sunyani by air, let's welcome <laughs> architect. Yeah, good afternoon once again. Um, hope you are doing well. And the sessions are going on pretty well. Hmm? So far, so good. Yeah. So um, I am here for the building regulations and code. I don't know why my parents named me justice, and I'm always dealing with laws, laws, and laws, and I'm not yet a lawyer. Maybe I should think of becoming one. Eh? OK, I'll consider that. Yeah, so we are here to look at the building regulations and then the building code. The building regulations LI 2465, and then the Ghana building code GS 1207. Yeah, so basically, we do an introduction, and then the building regulations, the building code, and then we are done. Okay, so regulations and codes, they are basically rules, okay, and standards. You know, the built environment is considered as one of the uh, uh, sectors that is very unsustainable. If you look at the amount of waste and amount of resources that the industry consumes, it means that there is a need for activities within the built environment to be regulated. And so these regulations and codes are a set of rules and directives and laws maintained by an authority which expresses the acceptable standards and procedure for an activity. So we have the built environment, how do we build? What are the standards? How do we ensure that people do not just uh, build anyhow? And how do we make sure that the buildings we are putting out there are going to ensure public safety and well-being of the people? It's not just the occupants, but the people around. Okay, adjoining properties, the occupants themselves, and even the environment. Okay, so we need these rules, we need these standards to guide us. And so the building regulation is a legal document that sets minimum. So if nothing at all, the buildings you design, the buildings you put out there, they must meet the minimum requirements that are necessary to ensure that buildings are safe. Okay, that are necessary to ensure that human habitations are safe, orderly, and healthy for the users. That is the essence of the building regulations. And then these laws, they govern design. So as an architect, um, there is a, uh, a researcher called Imri. He said that architects and structural designs are prescribed. Once you set out to the design, there are rules that you have to conform to. There are standards. You don't wake up and decide to get a, um, the width of a stair, 200 mm or 600 mm. There are certain standards that guide the way we design, the way we construct buildings, the way we make alterations to buildings, the way maintenance should be done, and also demolition. 
of buildings. And so the building regulations and code in some jurisdiction, they use them interchangeably, okay? In some jurisdictions, you have the building regulation and then others will mention the code. There are some countries that have a single document, they call it the regulations, and it's a combination of both the regulation and the code. But in Ghana here, we have a separate document called the building regulations, and then another separate document called the building um, uh, code, okay? So the difference between the two, technically, is that the regulations set the minimum standards that would ensure safety. But then the regulation makes reference to technical standards in the code. I hope you get it. So the regulations are there. You are supposed to cast a concrete or a concrete uh, um, uh, of this uh, uh, quality. And then it will make reference to the code. And then you go and check the various classification of concrete and then the qualities or the performance that is expected of you. And so that is what we have here in Ghana. We have the regulations and then the code. But when you read the regulations, there are a number of specifications in there that also informs you. And then there is always a link to the standards, to the codes, okay? And the code gives you the technical standards, the performance standards that are required as far as uh, building construction is concerned. So the codes provide measurement criteria for building construction and related activities in terms of performance, the size, and then column. The regulations will tell you that uh, you have to make sure that if you are working on a story structure, there are columns. But what are the technical requirements and performance of those columns? You now refer to the codes, and then you get these uh, technical uh, performance uh, standards from the code. Okay, these are some of the the essence of the building regulations and code. They are uh, to ensure that buildings are safe for human habitation. They help in minimizing building collapse. They also define enforcement criteria for these regulations. Okay, so um, they are very very important. They help sanitize the built environment. Now, a very short history on code. So um, there's this famous code called Humaribai Code, okay, in those ancient times. And those times, some of the codes, uh, there were some of them that were related to buildings, okay? If you check code 228 and 229, okay, 228, if a builder builds a house for someone and completes it, he shall give him a fee of two shekels in money for each sa of surface. Ancient. So even at that time, they were collecting their fees. So as architects, okay, once you are registered and you are working, make sure you collect your fees. Because even those times, they were hot collecting their fees. Now the second one that is very interesting, as far as building code and regulations are concerned. If a builder builds a house for someone and does not construct it properly, and the house which he built falls in and kills his owner, then the builder shall be put to death. Okay, there have been a lot of criticisms to the Humaribai Code that was, uh, too, was not friendly. Okay, yeah, but that was the genesis of uh, building regulations and code. And then a number of incidents also happened. Fires, Chicago fires, Rome, and then um, cholera, outbreak of cholera and all of those things. Okay, so these things necessitated the need for building regulations and code. I hope you get it. Yeah, so because we wanted to sanitize the system, make sure that the buildings we are putting up are safe for habitation, then there was a need for these codes. Now, when you come to Ghana, I'm sure you have been told in the previous lecture, the planning authority, okay, the district uh, authority, or the municipal, metropolitan, and then district assemblies, MMDAs, they are mandated by law to ensure orderly development in the built environment, okay? 
And then the various level of these uh, planning authorities, you have the National Development Planning Commission. So we have a planning commission that actually uh, puts out a plan for the entire nation. Okay, so that is at the highest level. And then we have the Land Use and Special Planning Authority. The previous lecture, I'm sure you heard more about Land Use and Special Planning Authority. And then the third one, the MMDAs. They are mandated to ensure that there is orderly development in the built environment. Now, uh, for about 15 years, we had the National Building Regulations, LI 1630. In 2022, the LI was revoked. And so now we have a new um, building regulations. We no longer have the LI 1630, but we have the building regulations 2022 LI 2465. Although it has been passed, when you go to most of the assemblies, they are still now in the process of shifting from 1630 to uh, 2465, okay? So you will still see remnants of the old in the assemblies, but some of them are really picking up. And we are hoping that in about a year or two, um, most of the assemblies will be working with the LI2465. It is for this reason that we have to focus on LI2465 and not the old, okay? So I'm sure maybe on your timetable was 1630. Was it 1630? Yeah, but we have to focus on the, on the new, okay? LI2465. How many of you have seen copies of 2465? Okay, so that is um, the LI2465. My own, I've been reading, uh, so the pages are coming. <laughs> That's my area, okay? I, I, my, my PhD was on building regulatory governance. And so this one is a Bible for me. I have to read cover to cover. Okay? Yeah. And so that is the focus of um, our discussion this afternoon. Now, when you pick the LI2465, that's the building regulations. So we are looking at the regulations and then you can have a look at the codes. When you pick the building regulations, there are two components. The regulations themselves and then there are shadows that are attached to it. Okay? So we have the regulation, regulation one, up to 207. 207 rules to bind you. 207 rules to give you direction as far as building, uh, design, and construction is concerned. But these 207 regulations have been grouped under 35 sections. Okay, so you open and then there are various sections and then the regulations are under these sections. And then there are 17 shadows, okay? 17 shadows from first to 17th shadow. And the first shadow alone has 10 forms, okay? These are the forms, application forms and certificates that will be awarded at every stage, uh, at different stages, as far as uh, building construction is concerned, okay? So ideally, if you want to have an effective building regulatory regime, a regime where we are regulating the way buildings uh, are being put up, then it's not just the regulations. You need to go beyond regulations to look at enforcement of these regulations. But the focus of our discussion this afternoon is on the regulations and then the shadows. The Local Governance Act, 936, that's where the mandate for developing the regulation comes from. It stipulates that the minister responsible for housing, in consultation with the minister responsible for environment, they have to come out with regulations to guide how buildings are supposed to put up. And so when you open the regulation, the very first regulation talks about the purposes of the regulation, okay? Safety to life, safety to property, ensure public health and well-being, and then environmental protection. So that is what the building regulation seeks to achieve. The life of the people, the properties, okay? And then the public health and well-being, and then environmental protection. And this 
application or this building regulation is applicable to the developer. It means that whatever has been specified in the regulation, it is up to the developer to ensure that his development conforms with what has been stated in the regulation. It is the responsibility of the developer. The responsibility lies on the developer. So as an architect, you can either align yourself with the developer or with the regulatory authority, that's the MMDA. Is it that you are working with the MMDAs to ensure that buildings are regulated or you are commissioned by the developer? And when you are commissioned by the developer to engage in building permitting and all of those stuff, the developer is expected to pay you for your services. It is not for free, okay? It is not your responsibility to follow up on permitting. But the developer, usually, they can appoint you as an agent to help in the permitting process. I hope that is clear. All right. When you look at um, Regulation 3, the meaning of building works. So ideally, the building regulation covers all building works. And so what are building works? Okay, building works include erection of or extension of buildings. So if you are erecting a new building or extending, you are uh, um, 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 attaching an extension, okay, to the building or extending the building, then you are expected to comply with the building regulations. Controlled services or fittings in or in connection with buildings. Material alterations of a building. If you are altering the materials, okay, that have been used for a building. Let's say uh, initially you had your building tiled, and then you now have to bring in these aluminum uh, composite boards for cladding. It is a material change, and so there's a need for you to comply with the building regulations. Materials and workmanship related to building, insertion of insulation materials in cavity walls, works involving underpinning. You must comply with the regulations. Change of energy status of a building. You want to change from the national grid and then have uh, your solar panels. No, you have to make sure that your building conforms with the building regulations, okay? Work requirements related to thermal elements works involving consequential improvement in energy performance. All of these works, from the regulations, they must conform to the standards that have been specified. And your building must meet these relevant requirements. The buildings that you design, okay, they must meet these relevant requirements. That's regulation three. Structural safety. The building should be able to carry its own weight that the dead loads and also the loads that are imposed upon it okay so structural safety very key the loading ground movement you have to design to ensure that there is no disproportionate collapse where if a section of the building collapses it, it affects the entire uh, uh, um, structure okay your building uh, must respond to that fire safety means of warnings and escape internal and external fire spread access and facilities for fire service access to and use of building. That's how come you have fire safety, right? And then um, accessibility, okay? So you need to know all of these things because it is a requirement. Your building must meet these relevant requirements. And then there is, apart from erection of the building, there is what you call material change of use. Material change of use. And if, Buildings, buildings with material change of use, whether a whole or part, they must comply with applicable regulations. And what are some of the instances where material change of use happens? Number one, use of a building as a dwelling where it is previously, it was previously not used as a dwelling place. So initially it was a, a commercial facility. Now you want to convert into um, a residential facility. It's you, you, you have to um, um, uh, apply for permit because there is material change of use, okay? Once you are changing from one use to the other, there's a need for you to apply for permit. Where it contains a flat 
where previously it did not contain a flat. So residential building, all right, but initially it was not a flat. Now we want to convert it into a flat. You need permit for that. Okay? Yeah. And then change of use of a space as a hotel or boarding house. Irrespective of the previous use, once you are converting into a hotel or a boarding facility, it constitutes a material change of use. And you have to make sure that your building complies with the applicable regulations. Okay? Where the current use is not described as work exempt from permit. There are some buildings that are described as works exempt from permit, meaning that you don't need permit for those buildings. But if you are changing from that to any other use, then you have to apply for permit. Okay? And then used as a shop where previously it was not used as a shop. Converting any other use into a commercial facility, you need to go for permit. So all of these material change of use, they must comply with the applicable regulations. And then your materials and workmanship, they must be appropriate, adequately mixed, or fixed to perform the function they were designed for. That is regulation seven. The materials you are using for your construction might be such that they uh, perform the function they were designed for. What of um, you are engaged on a project and then the client wants to import materials that have not been specified in the regulations. Or the client wants to adopt a new method of construction which has not been specified in the regulations or code. Under such a circumstance, what are you expected to do? These are some of the practical questions we may be asking you. Okay, you have been engaged on a three-story building, then, then, then the client wants to uh, go um, um, bring in a new technology, a new method of construction. As the architect, how will you advise your client? Okay, the process that you go through, you submit an application in writing to the district assembly, specifying the details of the methods and materials intended to be used. It's a new ma material, it's a new method. So you have to write to the district assembly and then you specify the details of the material or the, uh, the method of construction. And then an independent consultant will be appointed, okay? An independent consultant will be appointed based on recommendations from the professional bodies, okay? So you can call from uh, the GIA, the planners, the professional bodies, an independent consultant will be appointed. And the independent consultant will now assess and then report on the suitability, durability, and stability of the materials or construction method. It's a new method that you want to use in constructing your building. You have to write, and then the consultant is appointed in consultation with the built environment professionals and the applicant. The applicant must agree to the appointment of that particular uh, consultant. And then the consultant will conduct his assessment, establish how suitable the material or the method is. And then the applicant will pay the fees of the consultant. So that is the process you go through as specified in the regulations if you are working with new materials or an innovative method that is not specified in the regulations. Now, there are some buildings that are exempt from permit. You don't need permit, or you don't, you don't need permit, okay, for these works. And they are specified in the Ghana um, um, GS1207, that's the building code, okay? GS1207 is a building code. And so, like I indicated earlier, here in the regulation, they are making reference to what has been specified in the code, okay? So these works are exempt buildings and, and you don't need permit for them. So you shall not obtain permit for a one-story detached structure for storage playhouse. So you want to get a storage space, one story within your compound, no. You don't have to go for permit, okay? And there is a, a limitation. The size, 11 meters squared or 120 square feet. It must not go beyond that. It means that if it is beyond 11 meters squared, you have to apply for permit. Is that okay? Yeah, but if it is a small structure, then you don't need uh, 
to go for permit. Sidewalks and driveways, not more than 762 millimeters above adjacent grade. You are constructing your, I mean, your compound and you are doing your sidewalks and no, you don't need permit for that. Okay, those ones are works exempt from permit. Painting, okay, you don't apply to the district assembly that you want to paint your room. Hello? No, you don't apply that you want to paint your room. So painting, papering, tiling, carpeting, cabinets, countertops, all of those things, you don't need permit for them. You don't apply, you don't worry the works engineer, okay? Those ones, you are free to go ahead and get them done. Prefabricated swimming pools, less than 610 mm or 24 inches deep. So prefabricated swimming pool. It means that if it goes beyond these standards, then you have to go to the district uh, assembly. Okay? Yeah. Swings and other playground equipment, non face and movable fixtures, all of these things, they are works that are exempt. Yeah, yeah. What are the depths? Yeah, so those are the, the, and it is not just any swimming pool. This one is prefabricated swimming pool. So you buy it from the shop, okay? And then they are coming to just assemble. If it is more, no more than 600 mm deep, then you have no business with the uh, assembly. I, I hope you get it, yeah. Okay, so I mean, these are, these are works that are exempt, okay? But if they go beyond this, then the assembly, you have to visit them. The security post, what's the size? Is it less than 11 meters squared? It's not part of the building works you are submitting. Yeah, so it's not in isolation, it's the total area they are looking at. Okay, if it's an outhouse, still, once it's part of the main house, then some amount of charges will be applied. Okay, all right. Yes, so now we want to look at the permits, the notices, the plans, and certificates. I'm sure my other colleague tagged on the planning permit, right? Yeah, so let's quickly go through this one. Developer may apply for planning permit, so there's a form one. Later, I'll show you. So, Okay, so when you charge, okay. Yeah. And then to the mm. okay. Because, I mean, 11 square meters, how much cost is it going to add to the total floor or foot you are submitting for your permitting? <laughs> Matter around it, but it's a waste of time. The transportation. Yeah, so let's, let's go to the planning permit. I know another touch on it. So developer may apply for planning permit. There's a form one. I'll show that to you. And may be assisted by the professional. Application shall be addressed to the district planning, special planning committee. So this is what happens. When you are um, applying for development permit, two things happen. You first of all need a planning permit and then a building permit. Okay? So you go through the process of getting the planning permit and then the building permit. But most of the time, they are done concurrently. So you submit all your drawings and all your documents and then you first submit to the land use and special planning, uh, uh, the physical planning unit, and then they will transfer your documents to the works unit, and they will process the building permit for you. Okay, so this is the section 
on the planning permit. Application shall be addressed to the district planning, uh, social planning committee. Documents to accompany the application include evidence of a right or authorization to use the land in accordance with the laws of the country. Okay, you have to show evidence. And one of them is um, getting your land title certificate. If you have your land title certificate, then it's an evidence that the use of the land has been approved uh, for the purpose for which you are submitting. Sometimes you can do a land search or you can send in your registered deed. Okay, all of these things are evidence to show that uh, you have been authorized to use the land. The site plan conforming to the approved plan of the area. So you need the site plan and the scale is 1 is to 2,500. Block plan scale 1 is to 100 or 200. Zoning assessment and justification report. So where there is a change, okay, of use. Initially it was a residential uh, plot. Okay, the parcel was meant for a residential building. You want to put a commercial facility there. Then you have to uh, show zoning assessment and justification report. Okay, and that one will be issued by the uh, works department. Later, I'll talk about the circumstances under which you can ask for a change of use and then uh, for the assembly to grant you the change of use. Okay, you have to do assessment to make sure that the new use will not conflict with the uh, existing, existing use in the enclave. Okay, so all of those things, I'll mention them later. So you need your zoning assessment and justification report. Relevant drawings where applicable, and other reports where applicable. And the other reports, you are, asked, you are um, seeking for a planning permit, you may be asked to submit air or aviation assessment depending on the jurisdiction where the project is found. So in exams, okay, if the chief examiner decides to twist the thing small, you have been given a parcel of land close to the airport, then you have to be smart. Know that some of these reports will be necessary there, okay? Radiation protection, depending on the nature, hazardous substance that em emits uh, hazardous gas and all of those things, then it should tell you that it is a, a report that you will need, okay? Radiation protection, environmental protection, EPA, okay? Depending on the nature of the project, the scoping, okay? Once you do the assessment, you realize that this one is going to affect the environment, then it means that for that particular project, you will need environmental protection report or permit. And then petroleum operation safety assessment. A project then, then in Takrade, then you know that you are talking about oil. And so you have to be smart, okay? So these are the things. Uh, standard verifications, the use of new material. The Ghana Standards Authority must give you approval for the use of these new materials, okay? Your technical assessment, hydrological assessment, structural integrity assessment. The district assembly shall issue a planning permit certificate. I'll show you the certificate. And then entities with mandate for planning interventions shall obtain approval of their special plans from the district planning authority. There are some institutions, okay, who have been given mandates to go ahead with their own special planning. A typical example is the universities, okay? You don't have to uh, go to the assembly for any serious permitting. They have been given the mandate to plan the entire university campus, all the facilities, but you have to make sure that you obtain approval from the district planning authority. It's just the special plans, not the building, uh, building permit, okay? So the layout must be submitted to the assembly for approval, although you are an institution that is exempt from permitting. Prof. Yes, so, um, and yes, of course. So, yes, structural uh, integrity assessment. When, when is that necessary? If you are, um, uh huh, structural integrity. Yes, change of use, uh huh, and then. Structural integrity, it means the structure is there. You want to test the integrity, the integrity of the structure, okay? It's not structural analysis, the structural drawings you are submitting. 
or structural assessment. This one is integrity. The structure has not been, it's already, there's a structure. So change in use is perfect, okay? Um, we're told that the Malcolm disaster, that happened in 2012, it happened because of a change uh, in use. I mean, looking at the, the loadings, they rather place the heavy objects above ground. And that's what caused the collapse of the structure, okay? So if that is your intention, to have these heavy objects um, above ground, then you need to conduct a structural integrity assessment, and then you'll be given a report to indicate whether the structure has the capacity to carry the loads, the anticipated loads, okay? So, um, okay. so for, for all of these, for the purposes of your examination, you have to find out the circumstances under which these, and practice, yeah, 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 yeah. and practice, okay. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, changing material, okay. If you want to change the material, then you may have to conduct uh, the structural integrity. The building was initially not designed to carry these um, panels, cladding, and now you want to attach these uh, panels to the surface of the of the structure you need to assess whether the structure can hold these extra loads you are bringing in okay yeah so that's for the um planning permit okay so yes change in use this one is from the li 2384 okay the land use and special planning um uh, regulations under these circumstances the assembly will grant you a change in use Okay, number one is within the permissible use within the zoning scheme of the area. So, if you want to, you want to change in use, but the new use is permissible within the land use of the area, then there's no problem. And at that circumstance, then you'll be given a justification. The assembly will write that, oh, we can uh, give you a change in use. Okay, the second one, uh, where the change in use does not significantly alter the original intention of the plan or zone of the area okay it is not going to change the area from being uh, one use to the other entirely then we can allow it it's a residential area but already some shops are springing up already and you want to put up a mixed use facility fine that one is okay it will be granted it has minimal impact on existing services and infrastructure Okay, and then it does not cause disruption to the surrounding land uses, traffic congestion, noise, odor, fire, explosion, image of the area. Okay, maybe this is your facility is is fine, but the moment you put it up, it's going to destroy the image of the area. I mean, the uh, under that circumstance, then the change of use will not be granted. Okay. Where there is an intrusion of privacy, the intrusion must be of net benefit to the community. Although the change in use is going to result in an intrusion of privacy, it must be established that it is going to benefit the society. That's why we have to allow you to go ahead with that particular uh, uh, use. Okay, so under these circumstances, then change in use can be granted. Yes, now, so let's talk about the building permit, okay? Yes. The planning permit. Yes. I want to find out if it covers, like say you have a project and then there is a direct or indirect um, usage of your neighbor's property. Not necessarily to put your project there, but what you are doing will kind of affect your neighbor's property. Mm -hmm. Maybe the sewer lines or something would have to pass and you have to tap it from there. Or maybe you have to plant a crane and it has to be there to be able to, I mean, work on your project. So, I mean, that's more of the building permit, right? You are talking about um, obtaining a permit and then the circumstances where it may affect your neighbor. Yeah. That's what you want to. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll discuss that under. Um, the building permit. Usually for this planning uh, permit, and particularly the building permit, you need the consent of your, your, your neighbors, okay? So if it is a big project planning permit, there's what you call the public hearing. I'm sure you, in EPA, 
Yeah, so you need to conduct public hearing for people to come out with their views on how the project is impacting on uh, their, their privacy and all of security, all of those things. The same way, um, building uh, uh, permits, okay, sometimes depending on the nature of your project, you have to find out whether you have consulted the people around you. Okay, it's one of the requirements that one of the reports that you may have to submit if you are seeking for a building permit. Developers engaged in building works shall obtain building permit. Procedure for building permit acquisition. You have to apply to the district assembly using form three of the first schedule. So I'll show you the form, okay, during the, uh, under the schedules. And then you have to deposit your detailed plans. Initially it was three sets, but now for the new regulation, you have to submit four. Previously, you will make four copies and then you will keep one. You give one to the client and we submit the three to the assembly. Now you have to submit all four to the assembly. And I mean, your site plan, your block plan, your architectural drawings, your structural drawings, check the skill. In the regulations, I think they made a mistake. Architectural drawings, they made it one is to 20, one is to 40, but that is an error. Later, when you check in other uh, sections, I think regulation 36, details of the plans, they rather refer to um, one is 200 and then one is to 200, okay? But under uh, regulation 15, architectural drawing, the scale is one is to 20, one is to 40. I think it's an error. That's how I've placed an asterisk uh, there, okay? Apart from these plans that you submit, there are other submittals, okay? You have to submit your land use certificate if there is a change in, uh, of use, okay? Relevant permit and licenses, okay? Um, permit from EPA, you may need a license from, you need to submit that. These are other submitters. Report on stakeholder consultation. I hope you get it now. Yeah, so you need to add that, especially when it is established that your property is going to have an effect on the people. So uh, a residential area, you want to put up a church. The people around you must agree that we need the church there. Uh, the stakeholder consultation is part is the, is the client. So you as an architect assisting the client, you have to now go ahead and, and get those things done. There must be evidence to show that you met, and these are the minutes and all of that you've agreed. Stakeholder consultation must be done, especially where it has environmental impact. Okay, then whoever is assisting you with your processes will have to make sure that you do stakeholder consultation. Like the National Cathedral, I mean, ideally, stakeholder consultation. But Ghana here, they will tell you you've done stakeholder consultation, but they called their own cronies and they did the consultation. Uh -huh. But I mean, it is, it is uh, for a big project, public project especially, you need to advertise the stakeholder con uh, consultation, call for meetings, so that people can now come and then add their views and opinions about the project. Yeah, yeah. It's a small project, a renovation project. Yeah. A, a small innovation, innovation project. project, yeah. Yes, so it like requires, the one you did. Yes. Uh, it requires yeah, demolition. Remember. Yeah, it requires demolition. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as part of the application in principle, we needed to apply stakeholder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but because, like, we didn't do it, I'm just curious to know something like I mean, this. Do you no, go no, and ask the neighbor? Neighbor one, neighbor two. You know you have to go okay? to the EPA if you have to engage in demolition. Yes. And as part of that, they will ensure that you do stakeholder consultation and put in place measures to ensure that your demolition does not affect okay. the people. Right. Okay. Yeah, so we will do something on demolition permits. Yes. So you see the, the EPA, they have people they have uh, certified who are not workers themselves who help in these assessments okay uh -huh. so they have to uh, lead you to get these uh, stakeholder consultation done there must be signatories and addresses as part of whatever consultation that was done no 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 but when you submit your documents they will also do their checks that's why the epa of officials like andrina will not be directly involved in helping you get the assessment done but they have agencies that Gets the assessment done and they will now do inspection. So that's the control mechanism. Okay. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, so um, where are we? Yeah, so evidence of authorization to use line in accordance with the laws of Ghana, other relevant reports were applicable. And the relevant reports, regulation 14, the, uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, structural integrity report, radiation, environmental, all of those ones are reports that may be needed. Yes. Yes, so usually you want to engage in stakeholder consultation where it has been established that after your scoping, right? It has been a, or screening. Which one were you taught? EPA or screening? Yeah, so you have to, um, it is very important. If, I mean, your land use is intact and it's not going to have any impact, then there will be no need for any stakeholder uh, consultation. A residential area demarcated and they want to put up a residential facility. Do you need any stakeholder consultation? And for what purpose? But where it has been established that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right behind us, there was a school, but it's still a residential area. Yeah. They held a meeting and then they stopped us for bringing up the apartment. But it yeah. was a residential area. Yes, residential area, not one lot. From the EPA Act, if you are having multi, uh, 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 multi story or multi, uh, you have a, a building with different occupants, you have to go through the process of EPA. And as part of that, stakeholder consultation is very key. So if you are developing um, a residential enclave, not just a unit, not for one household uh, consumption, EPA will catch you. You have to get your environmental protection authority processes done, okay? Even now, as part of the requirements, mandate you need uh, to apply for your fire um, permit. Irrespective of the kind of building, it is now mandatory. You have to apply for your fire permit. Okay, so these are uh, some of the things. Because it was not just one unit. And as a matter of fact, once the people raise concerns, then you have to engage them. You need to engage them. And for a scheme like that, EPA, how are you treating your waste? It's going to have an impact privacy issues and all of that. So stakeholder consultation is key. You needed to have done that uh, earlier. Okay. All right. Yes. I want to find out from the uh, evidence of a rights authorization to use the land. Um, how does this play out? Where, let's say I have a piece of land and then and with my consent, someone else wants to build on it. But in applying for the permits, uh, I think usually they want the, the client's name to conform with that of the site plan, yeah. that, that kind of situation. Yeah. I'm trying to understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> so that I, I, yeah, but from the building regulations, okay, once the project a permit is granted and then there is a change of um, uh, owner okay you have to notify the district assembly within 14 days okay. within 14 days yeah, i mean we'll come there okay okay within 14 days you have to uh, uh, inform the district assembly that there has been a change of owner after the permit has been granted so ideally the process you are supposed to go through is to first of all uh, if the land you bought it from someone okay and the title is not in your name you have to go through a process of um uh, change of ownership okay so that you can attack that to all the side plans and other things okay sometimes you, what people do is that they go ahead with the construction and later they get a commissioner of oath undertaking to indicate that although the land is bearing this particular name uh, I have transferred it to this person, then has the commissioner of oath uh, um, seal. But in most of these instances, you know, uh, so that is also an, an, an additional requirement that if your structure is above three stories, okay, I mean, the stories is not like the way we interpret the ground floor, I mean, one, two, three, three is three, according to the regulation, okay. And so three stories above, it means that four and above then you need a design report. You need to attach that as well. 
and then the uh, Ghana National Fire Service, okay, permit. You need to apply for the permit and then deposit as bill detail plans with the Ghana National Fire Service after completion. The initial permit you are given, okay, is the approval in principle. When you apply to the fire service, they give you approval in principle, 24 months, meaning that you submit your plans, your uh, fire interventions, all of that, your sprinklers, everything, they will assess and give you approval in principle. And then later, you have to submit your as bill to indicate that truly you went by the, uh, uh, the plans that you submitted earlier. And then you'll be given uh, another uh, um, certificate, okay, after the 24 month period. Yeah, so this is the, the processes you go through. The, the design report. The design report, this, this one, they, they smuggled it in. Eh? Uh, they smuggled it in, and um, we are not there yet, but it's now a law. So very soon, we have to pick up steps to get there. There are instances where, because the assemblies, it has been established worldwide that the, the municipal assembly do not have the capacities to ensure uh, the management of these processes. And so we are eventually getting to um, a stage where private um, inspectors and then design auditors will not come into the system. So the assemblies will receive the drawings, they forward to these auditors, and the auditors are supposed to generate a design report to indicate that all the parameters set out in the design are okay. So you are vetting the design. Okay, you are vetting the design. You are doing, currently the district assembly, they uh, sit to, uh, with the technical committee, they look at all of these things. But we are getting to the point where you finish school, you get your certificate as an architect, and then you can set up a design auditing company where you are there and then the assemblies will be bringing their drawings, or individuals will bring their drawings for you to indicate that the drawings are in line with the building regulations, and then you give them the design report with your stamp so that if something happens, then they will fall on you. And so it's mandatory that if you engage in design auditing, you need your professional indemnity uh, insurance, okay? So that in case of any negligence, then uh, they can fall on the insurance companies to bail you out. Is that, is that okay? Okay. All right. And then of course you have to pay the required fee and then the processing will continue. So, I mean, once you submit the application, these things are supposed to be done within 30 days. Okay? Within 30 days, all of these things are supposed to be done. Submission of your application, the vetting of your drawings by the technical committee. So when this private sector thing kicks in, they can uh, send the vetting to individual design auditors for them to vet your drawings and submit their report. And then, Collation of technical findings, inspe site inspection will happen. Then there is technical consideration by the technical subcommittee. I'm sure she mentioned them, right? And then technical consideration by special planning committee, the processing, payment and collection of development permits. And then if there are any appeals, they can be resolved. So this is a list of all the agencies and the type of permit that you can obtain from them, okay? all the agencies, and then the type of Ghana Civil Aviation Authority, air safety permit, National Petroleum Authority, petroleum license, Ghana Tourism Authority, tourism license, Radiation Protection Institute, Radiation Protection, so all of them have been listed, okay? So you need to uh, take note of them. Sometimes, but Ghana here is what you call pre, uh, pre application you okay so submit design at the initial stages uh there's a meeting with authorities and you are setting parameters and you can even ame does that yes so application in principle okay is that client yeah yeah, yeah. yes the, the that's why i initially established that it is the developer responsibility to make sure that they comply with all of this. 
the plan on to get it done at the end of the day yes Residential building code. Good residential building size. Third spring class. But I travel this time. And then now, means of escape. Yeah. So aside that, is that the only thing you're supposed to factor in? Uh, a number of a number of parameters to go deep into that because that's why you be fire safety. Then they will elaborate the resource person will elaborate things you will need as far as uh, meeting the fire safety requirements are concerned. Key into into that. So the code is more of more of a, a reference material, so that when you sit down to design, and then you have to uh, uh, look at some fire considerations. Then you go there and check what are the standards, so that as you are designing, you make sure. The design conforms with these standards. Okay, the width of staircases, the location of all of these um, uh, uh, distances between um, uh, the distinguishers, okay, and their positions, all of those things, they are prescribed. That's why I said that as an architect, once you set out to design, you are already prescribed. There are so many things that are binding you, and you don't just I mean, design based on emotions, you need to make reference to these standards. The um, code, I mean, there's a soft copy. It's only the regulation that the soft copy, if you look at it, cry, you'll be some scanning be a church. Okay, but that one is not, it's not bulky. So, yeah, I mean, so you can easily lay your hands on one. Okay, and then from time to time, you, you make reference to it. Okay, yeah. Um, I, this one, AMA. Okay, I think they are press. Ghana Publishing Company, Assembly Press. I think AMA. Once you get there, they can get you a copy. You need one; it will be very helpful uh, to you. So, I mean, all of these. Sometimes the questions in, in exams, eh, they just want to test you uh, to find out whether you have an idea about requirements. Some of the requirements you will need. Okay, uh, if a certain project is found in a certain jurisdiction or it is in a certain, uh, um, I mean, area. Okay, so the moment you hear radiation, they know that those a scenario will be uh, uh, you have a scenario and then radiation, airport, okay, petroleum. Then it must click that some of these regulations will be needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do, I think, ASL, in engineering okay, services. So these are, uh, uh, agencies that you can follow, agencies that can give you this. Right. They can follow on your um, structural engineer to give you your uh, structural design analysis and your integrity reports. You can follow on your structural engineer. Okay, thank you. The person has been, also has authority, has been authorized. That's why they've been given the stamp. Okay, so that is the authority they have. They can get it done and then endorse it. Okay, but usually if you are an institution, like a public entity, and then you need these things to be done, then these are the agencies you want to follow. on. So if the question is such that it is a public entity that is procuring these things, and you are being asked which institutions can offer you these services, then you don't mention structural engineer or FNKTS name. I, I hope you get it. Yeah, because these are uh, public agencies and institutions that can give you these uh, reports. Okay. Yeah. So there's more to the. the yeah. These ones are. All, yeah. Plan sections and elevations shall be designed by a person qualified to design uh, the type of building. So the this regulation, I don't really. It, in some way, okay. The old one, they will state categorically that. Uh, architect, but the person uh, uh, qualified. So who, who is qualified? These are the issues I have with uh, these um, uh, this particular regulation. Okay, shall be designed by a person qualified to design the type of building. Well, plans and other relevant documents shall be signed by authorized persons. Okay, but there is a window here in the 
in the um act 936 uh, the land use and special uh, planning act okay that building plans to be submitted to the dpa shall be prepared by or under the supervision of and signed by an architect or engineer registered under the enactment of uh, the act so this one gives us a bit of uh, protection but it's not concrete i wanted the building regulations to be specific that you need if you go to rwanda you need an architect to sign supervision you need an architect if you sack the architect you have to appoint another architect so there's no room there's no room you need an architect to get all of these things done well provisions have been made in these new regulations to ensure that you always have an architect or uh, a professional supervising the uh, the project but if you wake up one day and all those men are made professionals then they are also professionals okay and then uh, so i really expected that there will be some uh, specifics sections on architects responsible for all building designs within so the old regulation is stated categorically that buildings within the metropolitan or urban area and definition of urban area in ghana is 5000 population of 5000 and above it stated categorically that these works were supposed to be done by architects but now in this new regulation is off it's off so you have to see okay <laughs> no restriction regarding the person who designed single story traditional building uh, yeah so act 936 if it is a single story traditional building a crossed dying that one is not architect your job okay a i mean there's no restriction as to whoever designs it it's our own family people who will gather and then we'll be mixing the mud to get a secular and then attach and all that you don't need an architect for that okay so act 936 that's the land use and special planning act section 107 talks about that these ones i will not go to them plan sections and elevations should indicate drawings clearly i mean these are the parameters for the designs that we send out the construction documents okay we need to uh, have a look at that building permits shall expire after a period of five years okay unless otherwise indicated by the planning authority if they give you 10 years then it means that fine but ideally the length of a building permit is what five years so if you are working on an abandoned project okay there's a scenario of an abandoned project then it must click that for that project uh, if you have to continue you have to reapply for permit i, I hope you get it uh -huh. you know i mean if it has gone beyond no so that's how come the questions can be uh, tricky okay that you have been commissioning a project and seven years after the project then then so what are the steps you will take to then these things should click that oh it has gone beyond the uh, permit expiration period so we have to reapply for a permit okay yeah developers shall apply for extension in writing and give yeah so if after the five years the project has not been completed then you have to apply for extension so there is also an extension permit you apply and then you are granted uh, extension and then yeah so it's here extension of time for further period may be granted based on the time the district assembly considers appropriate developers shall deposit oh in the regulations you have to provide justifiable reasons i mean it has not been specified okay so that one is within the ambit of the uh, works head of works okay if you write and you state your reasons and to them to the district assembly they accept that the reasons you have given are justifiable then they will grant you extension sometimes if the cash is not there that one too is a reason you know be so uh, along the line your projects so waste container storage up to deposit plants during uh, the extension for emergency repairs that is able to comply before commencing work emergency works uh luxury of time to apply okay for uh permit so under such a circumstance then the one day 
after commencement. Apply and wait. Things work. But the moment you start, then you have to notify the district assembly that because of this emergency, we have started this process and we are notifying you about um, uh, the, the process. And then they will also do their necessary assessment and then come and check on the project. Yeah, so these are the proof of ownership of land. The district assembly shall not grant approval to applicant who does not have proof of ownership of land. Proof of ownership, uh, the regulation means any of the following documents, where you have your land title certificate, registered deed, customary proof of ownership acceptable in the jurisdiction. So if you decide that for this area, okay, this is a uh, acceptable uh, means of establishing proof of land, customary, within this traditional area, then that one too is acceptable, okay? And then other evidence of land ownership, there may be other evidence of land ownership, like uh, there is this um, uh, missionary deed, okay? There are some lands that were given to the missionaries. Uh, uh, forefathers gave it to them for free, okay? They are bona fide property, it is dead. Those ones, no chief signs any indenture or any anything. It is for the missionaries. And so for churches like the Presbyterian Church, Methodist, those ones, they have missionary deeds. Those ones are also acceptable as a proof of ownership. And then official search results from the Lands Commission. If you conduct a land search, okay, if you conduct a land search, that plot A, B, C, D, you want to search and find out if that plot, um, uh, the one who is selling it to you, okay, is the rightful owner, and then the intended use is the uh, right land use for the area. That one too, you can use it as a proof of ownership. And then there can be statutory declaration, okay, like what happened recently, court case litigation, then they declare that this one is for Gamashi people, then it means that that one, it is law, okay. So once you have that statutory declaration, you can also use it as a proof of uh, ownership. Notice for change of ownership shall be given within 14 days after change of ownership, as I earlier indicated, yeah. Oh, this one you cannot read. So, exemptions. Exemptions, there are some institutions that are uh, exempted. Who has the regulation? You should read from the shadow. Oh, okay, yeah. So you can read for us. This one is, um, check, check the back. That's where the shadow is. No, shadow two. These ones are all shadow one, the form for shadow one. Mm -hmm. Yes, so as I'm building, you can read for us. Okay, Diplo number one, diplomatic missions. Yeah, so if you are working on uh, diplomatic missions, okay, the embassies and all of that, you yeah. don't need any uh, permit at all. But there's a, uh, they have to do something. Yeah, what are they supposed to do? They are required to provide these documents and um, basic drawings or plans as prescribed by the authority. Indicative sketch, block plans, elevations. So your block plans, elevations, indicative sketch, these diplomatic missions, you just have to provide them, okay? Yeah. What, then the next one? Then military and security installations. Yeah, so military and security installations. Uh -huh. Mention all of them. There are a number of them. No, just the two. No, 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 here. Yeah, so, so those are the, the two key um, uh, projects that are exempt from the permit. Apart from the one I earlier mentioned, the painting and the sidewalks, okay, apart from those ones, that's the LI um, GS1201.6.2. These two, okay. Um, no, read the other section down there. Okay, Ghana, okay, a district assembly shall issue guidelines regarding the application this one they procedures. left it to the district assemblies for the the following institutions it is up to the district assembly to decide what they do with them whether they will let them they are exempted all right but whether they will let them deposit plans or deposit their layouts or whichever okay that one is left with the so one is ghana airports company limited yeah, so ghana airport company ghana highway authority ghana highway authority department of urban roads urban roads so when they are doing their drawing for rules and all those things. Mostly, they may sub, they, they just have to deposit their plans at the district assembly and then uh, that is it, okay? They are an entity on their own, 
they are in charge of planning their own spaces, airport, all of those things. But the regulation says that it is now left with the district assembly within which they are found to decide what to do with them. Okay, the universities, they are all there, right? Yes, please. Uh -huh. The universities. Ghana Ports and Abo. Yeah. Land litigation issues. Yes, official search results for lands from lands commission. We have a lot of land litigation issues. And so let's take it that the rightful owner of a piece of land sells um, a plot of land to party A. And then at the same time, for some reason, sells it to party B. And then you go to the lands commission and then you, let's take it for example, I'm party B and I go and do a, an official search results. It gives me the owner, yes. And then I quickly get, I am, of course, I'm an architect. Okay, let's take it. I, I, so I'm able, become, amen. <laughs> so then I quickly do my designs and then I take this official search results to um, for permitting. Meanwhile, it's a, that same piece of land has been sold to another person. Why is the, um, let, let's take it, why is the district assembly accepting official search results as proof of ownership? Well, well, search results, um, it is the official search <laughs> results. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, once you apply, it goes to the Lands Commission, and they have documents to indicate who owns which land in Ghana. So once you are getting information from them, that makes it authentic. Under no circumstance will the ownership change. So if you have an official report from the Lands Commission that this land is owned by Kweku Mensa. Then truly, it is owned by Kweku Mensa. That's how come you have to follow up and get your land title certificate done. Because once you get your land title certificate done, it is documented with the uh, lands commission that you have gone through the process and that land is yours. So when you are selling it off to another person and the person conducts the land search, it will come out that truly the person selling it to me, he is the owner of that particular land. The challenge arises when uh, the place has not been demarcated and, and the base plan and those layouts have not been approved. Okay, and they are still going ahead to sell the land. That's where the challenge will come. But as far as the regulations are concerned, there's another clause. Okay, even if they give it to you in there, there is um, the completion certificate. Okay. If they give you a completion certificate, the law says that it is not uh, on the exact word. It is not a conclusive evidence that truly your your building even satisfied all the conditions. Although the assembly has come, they've conducted all their tests and realized that you have executed the project in line with the regulations. The regulation is giving a window for them to uh, uh, a window a window for them. Such like that even if they have given you that certificate, it is not conclusive that later when they find out that it was given in error, they will not change their mind. Okay? So if the search indicated that it was yours, and then later something happens and then they are kind of vindicated, you can't hold them to what they initially gave. Okay? Because there is that window that it may, it may have happened um, based on uh, force and error. Okay, so we gave you land, um, it is official, okay, but if later the Supreme Court declares that that land is not for that entity, then although we gave it to you as the official, it now becomes kind of unofficial, you have to come for another official document, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm to you and then you find out that there's no document on it what happens how do you show the evidence that is yours so you've been given a property and by then, your father by your father uh, and on the land there's a building on it which is about 20 years old mm -hmm. well he was living in he will it to you and you but you find out that there's no document on it so applying for the permit how do you show proof of ownership so which documents were handed over to you by your father uh-huh. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the only document mm -hmm. the father had was um 
you know they have certain areas like maybe tuc um, um state house and where they now share the the land for a group of people that was back then and then and the, the the father has passed on the land too but when you go to the lands the name under that area is tuc it's not the person's father but the father has had a chance to give it to another so how the name of the lands commission the name of the lands commission is the rightful owner okay so when you are being given so if i give you land i give you site plan oh the land after the gia is mine i'm dashing it to you you have to conduct a set to establish that truly i am the owner of the land and i can easily uh, 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 give it to you as as a gift okay other than that then people will be promising us lands and then later i find out that they are not even uh, 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 okay yeah so i mean under the circumstance okay the two you can even press and demolish the building and take over the land because you don't have any proof you have no proof for people staying in no, so there are there are sometimes especially um like uh resettlement areas sometimes a flood happened and then they give them an area and all that okay if you're able to land on a document to indicate that truly during that period although the land belonged to you you see they gave it to their members and it is then you can use that as a way of justifying or processing your documentation for your your land okay but i mean it is the lands commission the lands commission okay lands have been gazetted the chief the paramount chief they have their jurisdiction the families have their jurisdiction so the planning scheme they go through a certain process right at the community level district level it goes to the regional until it is accepted okay by the lands commission and then they go by what has been provided for them is that is that okay yeah okay so there can also be yes processing of application uh, seven days da shall notify applicants seven days after receipt of application and within one month whether the application is granted or refused so within one month they can either grant the application or refuse there are instances where they can grant but add conditions to it okay they will grant you the permit but they will indicate that these are the conditions attached to the permit so when it gets to the final certificate then they have to um uh, 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 make sure that you met the conditions and then the projects that you have executed complies with the regulations where there is refusal okay the dsi issued building permit certificate yeah, i'll show you the certificate where there are refusal an applicant who is not informed so you can submit and then you will not be informed that you have been granted or otherwise and you cannot go ahead unlike the previous um regulation 1630 1630 three months if you have not heard from them go ahead and build uh, so we are doing that to them we give it to them and they are delaying then three months pa, then we also build okay no penalty because they were supposed to respond within three months but with this one if you go ahead to uh, uh to build you have you have issues okay so the da's are mandated to issue bylaws for procedures for dealing with petitions so if you have not heard from them within one month then you can write and petition why you have been refused because they are supposed to give you in one month you can write to them and the district assembly themselves they have the mandate to constitute a body for dealing with these petitions if at the district level you are not happy then you can take it to the regional level the regional coordinating council will form a committee a committee made up of professional bodies and all that at the regional level if you are not happy then you go to court and maybe any home will be okay so after the regional if you are not happy then you can proceed to court so that is the uh, uh the, the processes okay yeah so there can be electron electronic submission the current building regulation allows for electronic submission of 
uh, these um, uh, permit documents. So these are a number of permits. Okay, you can have a building permit, temporary structure permit. From the code, if you want to put up a temporary structure, you have to apply for a permit. Okay, it's not permanent, a temporary structure. I think you have about 180 days. Okay, uh, within which you have to demolish the, the, the structure. Okay, and then you can have the change of use. You can have the subdivision and consolidation permit, subdivision division of land, okay, and consolidation. Permit for extension of time. That one you write, as we discussed earlier. If the permit expires, you have to write, and then they can grant you the extension after giving justifiable reasons, okay? And then demolition, demolition permit, okay? You have to apply for demolition to be done. And then certificate of completion for habitation. This section two, I have a problem, okay? So the ARC GIE have been publishing names of registered architects, but the new regulation is saying that database for built environment, BE is built environment, professionals, within the jurisdiction of the district assemblies are to be created and published in state-owned newspaper. Why are they doing that? Is it that if I'm in Accra, I cannot go to Sunyani to work? I don't understand. It's something we need to contest, okay? But that's what the regulation is saying now, that the district assemblies are supposed to create a database of built environment professional. And then they are supposed to um, uh, publish it in state-owned newspaper. Professional stamp shall be barcoded. To me, I'm not saying it to when they are giving you the stamp. <laughs> Maybe you can tell them that the, the regulation says that. And then the professional indemnity insurance, okay? As a contractor, you need one. The contractor may not necessarily be the builder. So the builder will also need uh, professional indemnity insurance. And then the designer of the building of height more than two stories. So if you are designing any structure of height more than two stories, then you need a professional indemnity insurance. Very soon, they will be coming after us. So, so let's prepare. Eh? Very soon. <laughs> yes. So beyond the permit, okay, beyond, yeah. Two stories, ground first, that is two, beyond that. The area is? Let's see, I'm, 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 I'm designing for like 5,000 square meters. It's just mm -hmm. one level. I don't need professional indemnity. There is a, um, there is a clause in the regulation that says that the DA, the district assemblies, uh, where the uh, footprint of the building exceeds a certain area, then you have to make special provisions for that. I think uh, is the pre-application meeting, okay? The pre-application meeting, where your project, okay, has a land area, I've forgotten the area, but in the regulation, beyond a certain area, then they have to invite you for a pre-application meeting and specify certain conditions to guide you. And so although your structure may not be more than two story because of the footprint, they can bring in these clauses and you have to get uh, uh, professional um, indemnity clause for, for that. Okay, so after the permit has been granted, okay, this section is also very important. Notification of work stages, okay? So these are the work stages, okay? you need to submit a notice of at least five working days before you do all of these things. They are 10 in all. You have to submit a notice to the assembly for them to come for inspection. Okay? They may or may not come, but they are... Uh, the post permit supervision shall be undertaken by qualified and certified professionals. So here we need to explore that as architects. Okay? Now, there is what we call the mandatory notification, okay, and inspection. For these ones, these 10, you may apply to them. They may come. They are expected to come, but it's not mandatory. But for these, very mandatory stages of notification, before placing a foot in, you have to come and inspect, okay? Before pouring an institute reinforced concrete member specified in the building permit, they have to come. Completion of roof framework. 
and then completion of all building works. What happens at this stage? Completion of all building works. That's why they come for the final inspection and give you the certificate of um, habitation. Okay. Yeah, for, for these ones, they are mandatory. Okay. And then the district assembly may appoint building inspectors to oversee and inspect work as specified. So uh, district uh, inspectors can also be appointed. And then at the completion certificate, before they grant, these are the three conditions they are looking at. That the building work has been completed or partly occupied before completion. The DA has been notified in accordance with public safety uh, requirement. There are some facilities you can construct the building, it meets the regulations, but there are certain public safety requirements, like uh, provision for persons with disability and all of those things, okay? So you have to make sure that um, uh, the building complies with that, okay? And then if they ascertain that relevant requirements specified in the permit has been certified, then they can grant you the completion certificate, okay? And then there is certification of installation. If you are installing any of these things, okay, then you will need a certification, okay? And usually the certification of installation is done by certified professional for specialist building works. So for these ones, okay, a swimming pool, prefabricated liquid tank, elevators, uh, underground gas tank, pumps, antennas, placement of solar panels, you need a specialist to grant you the certification of installation. When you install any of these things, you need a certification to be done. So there are some consultants that the assemblies can rely on and they will uh, inspect and make sure that you have complied with the regulations. And of course, the certificate of habitation, okay? So uh, there is an application form, okay? As part of the regulations, you apply. And then once they are satisfied that everything is fine, you can be given the certificate of habitation. I spoke with an engineer and she indicated that most of the time they are afraid to grant the certificate of habitation because, I mean, the moment you endorse it, it means that everything is fine, 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 fine. What if something happens? So they themselves, sometimes they are not willing to endorse uh, uh, these certificates. But the window that I found in the regulation, okay, that is, certificate is evidence, but not conclusive evidence of compliance with regulation. So they can issue. If anything happens, you, the one who built the structure, you are the one to be held responsible because it is not a conclusive evidence. Okay, they came for their inspection, they are okay. But there may be hidden defects. That one, the eye cannot see. And so, although they have given you certificate of habitation, it is not a conclusive evidence that everything is fine. Yes. The stages, you have to invite them to come to site mm -hmm. to supervise. Yeah. Uh, so they cannot um, say they will not be held liable if anything happens. The but they, does not they, they, because they refused to show up or they did not show up. Okay, they were, uh, it was a progressive inspection, okay. They were not there doing constant uh, inspection or supervision of the works. So that's why it is you, the developer, your responsibility to make sure that whatever you are doing complies with the standards. It is your responsibility. Okay, yes. So the fact that they came, you, you had a responsibility as a developer to ensure that your building complies, okay? And then there is regularization of unauthorized building. So there is what you call regularization permit. Okay, so you put up the structure, you do not inform anyone, then uh, they have to come and regularize it. Okay, uh -huh. if I mean there's something like that, the DA, the district assembly, shall direct persons responsible for unauthorized work to apply for regularization permit. Application shall be accompanied by these are the things you need to add as part of your regularization permit application. Okay, you have to add as built drawings because the structure has already been completed. Okay. And then structural integrity report to make sure that the structure is sound. Life and fire safety report. So the fire service will also go in and you get their report. Health and environmental report. That's the EPA. Okay. Any other relevant report for basic performance. 
And then the digital assembly shall conduct inspection and testing to establish that the work meets the relevant requirements. Okay. This one looks romantic for an exam question. But <laughs> okay, you've been uh, asked to and all of that. So an unauthorized building. What are some of the things? I mean, advise your client. What are you supposed to do? You have to apply for this. You need to add this because, or you can be asked, why would you need the following? Okay, as part of your application for regularization permit. And then you have to establish that as for the as build because the structure has already been completed uh, you needed to provide uh, the drawings okay the measured drawings and the services how they were placed and then structural integrity you tell us why we need structural integrity life and fire safety report you tell us health and environment okay yeah and then of course throughout the construction process you do some testing okay test for soil or subsoil a number of tests, tests for services, fittings, equipment, tests for materials. But all of these, uh, the district assembly, the head of works will indicate the type of test you want to conduct on your structure. Okay. Yeah. These ones too are very interesting. Okay. Compulsory maintenance. A building in a state of disrepair or neglect based on the opinion of the DA and constitute safety or health hazard to the public, the DA shall write to the owner requiring the owner to carry out reasonable repair or painting as specified. So if at the maintenance phase, your structure is not correct, the district assembly has the power to write to you that you have to maintain your structure, you have to paint your structure. And if you refuse, the head of works or the district assembly, they are supposed to go ahead with the maintenance on your behalf, and then they now take the money from you. <laughs> Someone is asking whether uh, this is being implemented, but it's in the law, and you need to know. Okay, yeah. So I should go over it. Okay, so uh, if in the opinion, this one is in the opinion of the district uh, assembly, if they establish that a structure is in a state of disrepair, uh, disrepair, it is not safe for human habitation, then they will write to you that, Mister. A bed. You have to repair your structure. They will give you the conditions. You have to paint, even painting. They can indicate that you need to paint your structure. If they send the notification to you and you refuse to do the maintenance or repair or to make sure that the building is sound and safe for habitation, then the district assembly themselves can now go ahead with the maintenance, and then you will be surcharged. The cost of the maintenance, you have to pay. They will come, you think they will come and do it for you? Then you will pay. Uh -huh. So when you read the code, the code actually directs them to go proceed to court and take the money from you. Yes. And the same thing happens if, uh, yes, your structure, there's a dangerous or unsafe structure. It's the same process. Okay, they can even demolish. They can specify that you need to show up certain aspects of the project so that it will be safe. If you refuse to do that, they will do that and come and take the demolition fee from you. Okay. Yeah, so uh, very soon we'll be having the use of private inspectors. Okay. Okay. And then the plan certificate, a certificate to be issued by private inspector to the district assembly, certifying that the design has been checked and plans comply with the regulations. So that's the, the plans, uh, the report, the design report. Okay, you have to produce a plans certificate to indicate as a private entity to indicate that the work that you have assessed it complies with the regulations. Okay, and then the final certificate. This one, all of these are under the private inspection. Okay, if you're a private inspector, then you have to give a final certificate to the district assembly that the works that you have inspected, they comply with the regulations. And so they should go ahead and give habitation permit to the developer. Okay, so all of these are there. We are done with the regulations. That's all I want you to know as far as the regulations are concerned. Now we look at the shadows and then a bit of the code. Yes. 
Once you get to the first floor, you can actually your building line can actually be on your fence wall. So what happens? Does it is it really true? Like maybe you can have a cantilever which is exactly on your fence wall. On the, on the fence wall. Yeah. So usually, usually when they are assessing, they are assessing the setbacks. Okay. When they are assessing the setbacks, they use the uh, the the block plan. Okay. Where you have the outline of your plan on the site with the road showing your service lines and then the dimensions you have provided on the ground floor okay and so for for that reason most people try to uh, be smart okay they have a small body down there and then when they go up okay then they begin to anti liver and all of that if you are doing proper assessment then that should not be uh, allowed okay but I, I really have to find out this i'm not so sure but the rule is that you have to maintain your setbacks okay make sure that minimum three meters on site at the frontage 4.5 and then at the rear three meters okay even that there have been some changes okay so we get to know the changes now it's two meters two meters be around uh -huh. they are trying to cut down small small okay yeah Oh, these ones you can't you can't see them i have to scan them again okay so these are the uh, the shadows i'll scan them again and send these are the shadows and then no so these are the forms for the first shadow all of these are the 10 forms okay for the first shadow and then these are the uh, other shadows okay so suitability of materials, thickness, all of these. And then there is some bit of uh, design provisions in the regulation. OK, so let's go through a few of them. Orientation, this one, orientation shall be east-west as is, unless site and topography demand otherwise. OK, that's what the regulation says. It means that your structure must be facing the north and then uh, the longer side, OK, will be facing uh, the northern side appropriate detailing must be provided to take care of natural lighting solar penetration so if you are the private inspector okay who has to provide the uh, uh, grant the plan certificate then these are the things you want to look out for okay the orientation daylighting solar penetration ventilation no part no part of the building must extend beyond building line of a street except eaves that must not project beyond 600. Okay, so where you have a street, then no part of your building must extend beyond the building line. Okay, the building line for the area. All the buildings in the area, okay, the lines are all there, and then for yours, yours is extending into the street. It's only the eaves that are allowed to extend onto the street. And even with that, you must not go beyond 600 mm. No part of the building must extend beyond the building line of a street except eaves. Yeah, so I've mentioned that. Entrance gate or doors or windows shall open entirely onto the property of the owner. Okay. So you have your gate and you want to open outside. It must open onto your own property. Okay. So these are some design. There are a number of them in there. I just wanted to bring uh, these ones. And not beyond the building line or fence line. So, uh, you cannot open it's like that it goes beyond the fence line there's a difference between the fence line and then the building line the building line where the building ends and then the fence where the boundary of your property okay your gate must not extend beyond that okay yeah so side coverage yes let's look at side coverage okay so when you are filling the building permit they ask for uh, the built and then the unbuilt areas okay so these ones must guide you in your design, okay? For a single story detached, the side coverage should not be more than 50%. It means that it should be 50% or less for a single story detached. 
And then two and three story detached, 40% or less. Single story semi detached, 60% or less. Two or three story semi detached, 50% or less. Okay, so when you do your calculation and they are doing the assessment, these are the things they'll be looking out for. Coverage should not be more than 75% of the plot if it is a business premise. Make adequate provision for loading, accommodation, and car park where the area is zoned as a residential area. So you have um, a commercial, a business property in a residential zone, okay? Coverage must conform to the standards of the residential zone. I, I hope you get it. So you have a business area in a residential zone. You don't follow the provisions for uh, business premises. Rather, it must conform to that of residential zone. And then other flaws of businesses premises used for habitation, the floor use shall not cover more than 85. So you can cantilever onto the, the wall, but make sure that it does not, you don't use about 85% of the, uh, the, the, the space, okay? So although they know you can cantilever, they are also restricting you. It's like that your land is small, you do something small on the ground and you get to the top end, it's not like a tree, no. Okay, so these are some of the, yes, so regulation 207, the last one, revocation and savings, okay? The national building regulations, LI 1630 is revoked. So as we speak, you speak now, you cannot use any provision of LI 1630 to make any justification. You have to use LI 2465 and then you are good to go. Oh no, yeah, so, we take a, a break, eh? let's stretch for about five minutes and then we do something small on the code and then we'll be done. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. So let's stretch for about five minutes. We do something on the code and then we are done. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's continue. I want to look at the, the Ghana building code. Okay. As I, yeah, so let's do some 20 minutes and then we look at some other things, okay? Um, the Ghana Building Code, as I earlier indicated, is more like a reference standard, okay? It's a reference standard. And so uh, the regulations, okay, for some sections, they will tell you go and look at the standards in the Ghana Code. And then for most of the technical areas, like the construction itself, construction of different elements and the components, their standards are in there, okay? Previously, we were making reference to BS, BS. Uh -huh. So now we are also making reference to GS, okay? Ghana standard 1207, okay? And then the section will, will follow. Yeah, and then the section is on the driving, okay? Yeah, so we look at um, we look at the question that they dropped last year. It's likely it will not come this year. Yeah. Um, the Ghana Building Code 2018, uh, and then these are the sections. Okay, these are the sections from one to thirty-eight. So they are thirty-eight A to J. Okay, uh, this one we will not ask you what are the sections of the Ghana Building Code. No. Oh. Yeah, extent of application. These ones are not very important. Administration, okay. So the, the head of works department at the assembly plays a very key role as far as administration of the Ghana Building Code is concerned, okay. He's the one who receives all the applications, the permit, review, construction, drawing, issue, notices, and all of that. So the head of works plays a very key role. And we are hoping that in the near future, we will get some of our architects heading some of these departments because we believe that we are competent. Okay. Yeah. So it's an area that we will have to be uh, looking at. Okay. In the event that there are practical difficulties, okay, in complying with the code, okay, the head of works has the authority to grant modifications, okay, so you are doing a particular thing, 
And then the standard that has been prescribed in the code is such that it is practically impossible to get them done. Then the head of works has the authority to grant some modifications. Okay, so after a request from the owner or the developer, the head of works shall first find, uh, assess the reasons that makes strict letter compliance to the code impractical. So you have to establish that, oh, as for this, what you are saying is true. We cannot comply with it, and so there's a need for modification. We establish that the modification is in compliance with the intent and purpose of the code. So the modification that you are requesting for, he also has to establish that it does not flout any sections of the code. Okay? You are asking for a certain modification. You have to make sure that after his ass assessment, establishing that truly uh, there is a need for modification, you will make sure that your proposal does not flout any sections of the code. And then you will establish that such modifications do not lessen the health, accessibility, life, fire safety, and structural requirements demanded by the code. So a question can be posed as the head of works. A developer has requested for a change of then, 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 then to modify this aspect of that. What are the processes you go through in order to ensure that these modifications are effected? Then it means that you first of all make sure that strict compliance will not be possible. And then you have to establish that the modifications okay, will not compromise the standards in the code. And then you also make sure that it does not lessen the health because the codes are there to ensure that to ensure health and safety okay access and then life and fire safety and all of those things so um that is what you do as the head of works this one is a uh, flood zones okay so there are provisions on flood zones okay in the code but sometimes you can grant modifications based on these factors okay Based on the characteristics of the site, the topography, okay, if the topography renders the elevations in the standard code to be impractical, then he may grant modifications. Failure to grant modification may result in exceptional hardship, making the plot undevelopable. undevelopable. Okay, there are standards for uh, flood zones, but looking at this particular parcel of land, if you don't modify, then it will be impractical to dev ever develop the land. Under such a circumstance, these modifications may be done. Granting of the variance will not result in increased flood height and additional threat to public safety. So although we are modifying, you have to establish that it's not going to increase the flooding in the area and it's not also going to compromise on the health and safety of the people. Variance is considered the minimum necessary to afford relief considering flood hazards okay so although there is a variance it must meet the minimum safety okay that has been prescribed in flood areas okay so these ones are permitting there is a um, uh, annual permit in the code okay so for electrical gas mechanical and plumbing installation usually they are giving um, annual permits, okay? Uh, detailed records, detailed records of all alterations and the annual permit shall be kept by the person or entity or filed with the head of works, okay? So for those sections, there can be annual permit. Permit for temporary buildings, okay? Yeah, so that is a permit granted, granting limited time for erection existence and selective compliance with the code for occupancy which by nature will exist for a short time. So usually for a short time, you can grant a temporary permit. And then phased approval, okay? The head of work shall issue permit for construction of foundation or other parts of a building or structure before submission of construction documents. The application in, um, in principle, okay? That is the phased approval. So you just send your foundation drawings while you are working on it. You are giving permission, okay? To continue working and then um uh, uh, you you go ahead with the project and later get the drawings okay the holder of a phase permit shall proceed at their own risk with building operation and without any assurance that the permit for the entire building will be granted 
Okay, we can grant you the phase permit, all right, but there is no assurance that at the end of the day, the permit for the entire building will be granted. It means that you have to make sure you comply with the standard so that you don't get yourself in a situation where uh, eventually your permit cannot be granted. Yeah, so these ones, you can read them, the content of the application permit. And I'll send you samples of the, the permit, okay? Samples of the permit, uh, I don't have time to show them. They are PDFs here, samples of the permit. And then get to know the content of the permit. If it is a building permit, or what, what is written in there? If it, uh, it is a, a completion certificate, what are the contents? Okay, you need to know all of these contents uh, for your examination and then for life. <laughs> okay, so these are some of the, the, the contents. Valuation of proposed work. There's a section where they will tell you to quote the total cost of the project on the permit. Okay, so that is the valuation of the proposed works. And then other data entries, uh, yeah, so construction documents. These ones, yeah, I think you can, you can read them. Yes, okay. So there is what you call design professional in responsible charge. Okay, at 1.9.3.4. The head of work shall authorize owner or owner's rep to engage design professional with responsible char uh, charge. Some instances, as, uh, in some instances, a substitute design professional in responsible charge shall be appointed and will be expected to carry out the work that would have been done by the original design professional. The head of work shall be notified by writing if there is a change in the registered design professional. So this is where they are trying to say that for every project you need a design professional in responsible charge for supervision. And when you are stacking the person, you have to appoint another person, okay? So let's see how this will be operationalized in the future. I doubt if they are doing it now, okay? Uh -huh. So that's the design professional in responsible charge. Yeah, so he reviews and coordinates submission document prepared by other, others, including phase and deferred uh, submissions, okay? And then demolition, okay? Demolition permit. 1.7 of the code. Notify all utility companies related to the building. Permit shall not be granted until utility companies issue a release indicating. So we can create a scenario that you needed to demolish. What are you going to do as a design professional in responsible charge or as the supervisor of the project acting on behalf of the developer? If you want to engage in demolition, then what are you going to do? You have to notify all the utility companies related to of course, you have to send in your application, okay? And then on the day of demolition or before the demolition, you notify the companies. And then the permit shall not be granted until these companies issue a release indicating that all respective service connections and equipments have been removed, sealed, and plugged in a safe manner. Okay? Note, EPA may require you to inform security agencies before the demolition. Is that okay? Yeah, permit for temporary structures, okay, usually erected for a period of less than 180. Okay, 180 days, you are given, uh, you know these pavilion structures and any temporary structure, 180 days for events and all of those things, you need permit. You erect them, they can't have to come and inspect if everything is fine, because they are looking to ensure that people who come in are hot, safe. So you don't just organize your concert and you think you have just put up a pavilion or something and people should just come in, okay? You need uh, that. So temporal structures and their uses shall conform to structural strength, fire safety, means of escape, accessibility, lighting, ventilation, and sanitary requirements of the code. Okay, so that, this is what you go through uh, for the temporary structure. The permit fees are there. Okay, these are circumstances, okay, under which um, the permit may be uh, revoked, okay? Yeah, so when the head of works is satisfied with the kind of works that has been done, and he's able to establish that it conforms with the regulations and the code, then you'll be issued with, uh, 
your permit. Application shall be deemed abandoned 180 days after application. So you send in an application. If it travels for about 180 days, then you have to restart the whole process. The developer, if you are given permit and then after 180 days you have not even gone, you have to apply again. Probably the con yes. Yes, 180 days after approval and even application. If you apply 180, you have not been given. You have to start the whole process again. Uh -huh. But that's what the regulations are saying. Okay. Permit becomes invalid unless work starts within 180 days after issuance of the permit. Okay, so if you are given the permit and we did it null and void, you have to start application process again. Okay. The head of work department is authorized to grant in writing one or more extensions of time for period not more than 180 days. So he can grant in the regulation, they will tell you that give justifiable reasons and then there will be an extension. But in the standards, they tell you that even though you have justifiable reasons, the extension cannot go beyond 180 days. Okay. Yeah. Permit shall not be considered as a violation of code even when given in error. Okay. So if the head of they give you permit, the fact that you've given you permit does not mean that uh, if you are doing something wrong, you are covered by the permit. No. Even if they themselves made a mistake in issuing you the permit, it can later on be revoked. Okay. The head of work shall prevent occupancy or use of a structure in violation of the code. Yeah, so this is what we spoke about. The exemption from permits. We spoke about that. Okay. Exemption from permits acquisition, railways, any government uh, uh, um, entity, okay, they may be exempted from the code. Railways, all of that for them, they don't this do not go through the process of permitting. And then inspection, preliminary inspections, and then progressive that is the notification at the stages. Okay, yeah. And then we spoke about certificate of compliance, it's a certificate stating that materials and products be specified standards or that work was done in compliance with the approved documents. Okay. So new materials, equipment, and systems or method, like I described in the regulations, okay, they have to appoint an independent consultant and then he has to assess that these methods or materials are okay. And then the applicant, the developer will pay for the services of the consultant. Stop work notices. There was an issue in court where, I think they, they want to write stop work or something. Demolish somebody's room. Now, the new regulation, you cannot just do your right on the wall. You have to write in, uh, 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 in writing, okay? Stop work order shall be in writing. So they cannot just come and write on your wall. That's not what you do. Okay? Produce my bit. Stop work <laughs> shall be in writing. Okay? It shall be in writing and delivered to owner of the property involved. Personally, I hope you get it. It must be given to the owner of the property to go personally. Okay? By certified registered mail address or delivered in any other manner prescribed by the local laws. The cited work shall immediately cease upon issuance. Unlawful continuance shall be subject to penalties prescribed by law. The order must state reasons and conditions under which work can resume. Okay? So it's not just stop work order, but they must tell you that you have not, uh, you don't have permit, come and regularize. You are not doing this. You've not hoarded your site. You've not done this. You have to give you the conditions why you have to stop work. And then tell you that if you are able to um, rectify them, then uh, you will be good to go. Okay. On same structures, I spoke about that under the regulations. Okay, so the same apply here. Now, right of entry, okay, the right of entry onto your site. The head of works has the right of entry under the following circumstances. So they cannot just enter any house, okay? There's a circumstance under which they can enter. 
where it is necessary to make an inspection to enforce the provisions of the code. Okay, and you say, No, no, that is not allowed. But if it is necessary to ensure enforcement of the provisions of the code, then you have the right of entry. Why it is necessary to make an inspection to enforce the provision of the code, reasonable cause to believe that there exists in a structure or a premise a condition that is contrary to or in violation of the code. So they must establish that there is something really going on wrong before they can trigger the right of entry. Okay, it's not at their leisure when they don't have money in their pockets and then they come to your site and when they are leaving, you give them a, a, a TNT. No. Okay, these are the circumstances under which they have the right of entry. Entry must be requested. And when refused, the head of work shall have recourse to remedies provided by the law to secure entry. So they have to request. It's not like you are not there. Nobody is there and then they just enter your site. No. Entry to your site must not be requested. Certificate of occupancy, change of use, change of occupancy, uh, these things have addressed them under the regulations. Temporary occupancy, revocation of occupancy certificate. So you can be given the occupancy certificate and then later it can be revoked. And these are the circumstances. These are the things that look romantic to me, okay? The head of works can revoke the certificate of the occupancy for the following reasons. When a certificate obtained under the provisions of this code was issued in error, okay? They didn't know that the building was that defective and they gave you occupancy. That is issuance in error. So they can revoke the occupancy permit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Name on. But it was your responsibility to make sure that the structure conforms to the provisions in the regulation and code. The code and the regulations are applicable to the developer. For us, we came for inspection. And when we conducted the necessary checks that we deemed appropriate, it was established that the building was in a good condition. And we left. Later, when we have reasonable cause, okay, to say, to justify that, no, the permit was issued in error. You can revoke their permit. Okay, that's why we are saying that it is not conclusive evidence. The fact that you have the permit does not mean that you will do everything right. Okay, and then when the certificate was granted on the basis of incorrect information supplied, okay, if the information you gave was incorrect, then they can revoke the permit. Where it is determined that the entire building or structure or part of it is in violation of any ordinance, or regulation or any provisions of the Ghana Building Code. Okay, so under these circumstances, they can revoke your um, occupancy permit. A typical example, like the Mokom situation, okay, if they had gone around and realized that the loadings on the building was uh, wrong, and then they did not take the necessary uh, measures uh, for ensuring that the, they showed up the foundation because the area was made up ground and all that. They will not allow you to kill people. They will revoke occupancy and then you have to uh, close your shop. Okay? So you can be given the occupancy permit but it can be revoked. These things are on um, um, enforcement of the code. These ones you can read them. Occupancy classifications. We will not ask you what is class A, class B. No. They are already in the code. You can refer to them. Okay. So uh, these are for your information. Okay. Uh, and then there are some special. Okay. Plot size requirement, uh, frontage sizes. These ones you can read them. I want to get to. Yeah. So these were the setbacks that we were talking about. Okay. Yeah, residential buildings shall have rare open space average with three meters and no place measuring less than 1.8. So under no circumstance should uh, the building, you have your building like this, and then when it gets here, 0 0.6, then you tell us this is three meters. Okay, uh -huh. that, that should not happen. Uh, 
the back side shall have three meters for plots of depth less than nine meters okay if the depth the depth of the plot is less than nine meters uh, for buildings up to uh, seven in height the rear opening may be reduced to 1.5 so if the depth is not up to nine meters then the back instead of three already that in size in the moon okay it may have a the way uh, it may spread that way but the rear may be less than nine meters then you don't have to take three meters now nah, okay so these are some of the provisions in the in the in the code so you need to read these ones minimum side open three meters on both sides of the detached building yes so i want to get here okay, now there are sustainability provisions in both the code and then the regulations i did not speak about the ones in the regulations because definitely it will make reference to what is in the code okay now there are two key ways that your building can achieve um, um sustainability there is what you call the prescriptive compliance path or the alternative compliance path but before that let me read this one the requirements in the section of the ghana building code on green building is applicable to so what we are going to discuss is applicable to private office and commercial or industrial buildings throughout ghana that are above 5,000 meters square total gross floor area. So if you are working on any scheme with an area more than 5,000 meters squared, okay, and then it is a private office, commercial or industrial building throughout the country, then it must conform to the provisions uh, on green buildings specified in the code. I hope you get it. Yeah. So if I want to set questions on that, a building a client has commissioned you to design a building with floor area seven thousand okay i mean they are chucky home as it is going beyond it means that we are looking for okay yeah about 500 big building okay these ones they must comply with the uh, green building requirements in the code okay compliance part so you can either go by the prescriptive or the alternative compliance method so which one is the prescriptive okay per the code if you want to go by the prescriptive what has been prescribed then you need to work on energy efficiency requirements and the energy efficiency requirements you have to look at passive design strategy so your design okay you must show evidence that you have taken care of passive ventilation cause ventilation Air can easily move through. If you are doing that, then you are being sustainable. Passive cooling, okay? We don't have to put on the air conditions. And then daylighting, okay? You don't have long corridors, dark areas. Then it means that you are trying to achieve energy efficiency under the prescriptive uh, uh, channel. And then the building envelope uh, properties, window wall ratio, okay? There are some standards that you need to look at the wall and then the window the ratio okay there are standards that you need to look at openable windows at least 15 percent of the occupied floor area so when you are checking the total area of your openings they must correspond to about 15 percent of the total floor area of the space i, I hope you get it that's why i'm saying that as an architect you are prescribed and this is the prescriptive method okay if you want to achieve energy efficiency you have to use passive design strategies and then you have to look at the building envelope solar heat gain <laughs> sorry solar heat gain coefficient okay you have to check your solar heat gain coefficients okay all of those things and these are some of the some of the standards okay for uh uh the, the the solar heat gain efficient uh, coefficients are there and then where you have to use air conditions you have to make sure that your air conditions are energy efficient air conditions okay and then especially the ratings okay you don't use 0 0.1 star air condition if you want to achieve sustainability okay uh -huh. at least three and above then we know that you are getting there okay and then the uh, you know we have this inverter type okay that is able to study the uh, and regulate 
the indoor um, um, uh, temperature and all that. So these ones are more energy efficient than the other ones. Okay, that's the variable speed drives. Okay, you have the variable speed drives, and depending on the temperature within the room, then it will adjust automatically. And then you have to look at lighting and electrical power. Okay, lighting control systems, photoelectric sensors. So you have sensors and all that. If you are bringing these ones in, you are minimizing the amount of energy that the building will consume. And so that is the prescriptive method. You are being energy efficient. And then uh, solar photovoltaic, okay? The use of solar panels, solar fans, solar air conditions, all of these things. If you include them, then you are gaining marks for the prescriptive under energy efficiency. And then you have to work on water efficiency. I will not go through all of them. What are some of the things that per the code, okay? When you put in place in your design, you will be water efficient. One of them, at least 50% of the roof area to be used for diversion of rainwater to dedicated storic tanks. Okay, so these are prescriptions in the code. Okay, uh, reuse of treated water for irrigation, cooling towers, or for flushing, all of these things under water efficiency. So that's number two under the prescriptive uh, method. Waste management, how are you treating your waste? Okay, so the, there are some measures you need to go through in order to treat your waste. And then the fourth one is indoor air quality. Anything you do to enhance indoor air quality, then it means that you are trying to uh, go by the prescriptive compliance part. So when you submit your drawings, they want to check whether you meet the sustainability criteria as far as the prescriptive compliance part is concerned. Then these are the things that they will be looking out for. Okay, exam condition, you have been commissioned. What are some of the things you can put in place to ensure that your buildings are uh, uh, green, okay, or they conform to the provisions of GS1207? If you want to go by the prescriptive part, then these are the stuff. And then there is the alternative compliance part. That one is very, very simple, okay? We can even ask you in exams to describe the two ways where your building, according to the Ghana Standards Authority, uh, uh, standard 1207 can meet um, the uh, uh, green building provisions. Okay, so the two key, the prescriptive and then the alternative. For the alternative, it's very, very simple. They are international certification systems. Okay, and so if your building is certified by any of these systems, then it means that your building is already green. So you don't have to worry you about it. So if you have edge, lead green uh green star if you have any of these regions then it is also acceptable by the regulations and when you have that what you have to do is that as the project owner you must submit the design certificate one of the above mentioned certification systems to receive the green uh, the building permit to get a certification of habitation the project owner needs to provide either the final certificate from the above mentioned system or arrange for an accredited third party inspector to conduct a site visit and issue a report of compliance with the respective certification requirement. Okay, so if you have edge certification, then it means that it is assumed that your building actually meets the provisions in the building code and your building is green. So you just have to send in your certification and then it will be recognized. Or you now have to bring in a specialist, an edge expert, for him to come and conduct. Uh, inspection to make sure that you comply by the provisions in the certification and then that should be that that brings us to the end of my presentation on Ghana building regulations and then Ghana building code question can value we don't have a, an, an estimate of how much the project is going to cost so how will you go about approach you know that you find the total floor areas and then you multiply by uh, the cost of uh, a typical cost of a previous project whether it is low end but i'm sure you use the low end one because you want your fee to come down okay uh -huh. so low end middle or high end uh, uh, rates and then that should give you the total valuation of the uh, the project okay but the calculations they are using now now they are using the floor area they don't even look at the the value of your project 
the floor area and then they give a certain rate for the fence a certain rate for uh, the some calculations and then they give you the fee yes i have a comment on the prescriptive compliance yeah. Yeah. so we are supposed to prescribe some kind of gadgets for our buildings shouldn't there be a way of i mean the gadgets that are coming to the country being regulated to have those standards or those prescriptions are you into politics no sir <laughs> so that we we don't have to yeah yeah i mean we ban the importation of used um fridges but people still find ways of bringing them all of these are supposed to enhance how our buildings are sustainable okay but unfortunately that's that's the way we are living okay so you must have a certain standard a certain threshold and then uh maybe it's a matter of time okay it's a matter of time my my cousin in the states um wanted to change his heating something something he has to go for permit you can't just uh, something small permit they have to come and inspect and do this and make sure there's a movie twelve thousand dollars <laughs> yeah 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 so that is where they have got into it's a matter of time maybe you'll get there okay yeah any questions for me i want us to look at the question that they it's here national building regulations after <laughs> after successfully going through architecture school and serving your probation period you have received further training through seminars on building regulations and code in preparation for your professional practice examination. Based on the experience and familiarity with the Ghana Building Code, explain the following and circumstances under which they would be required in your practice as an architect. I, annual permit. Okay. 
Sorry. Okay. So at practical completion, what happens? The certificate. Okay. The release of moiety. Why? What is the guarantee? You need to be knowing the reasons why these things are done, and the um, uh, the yeah the reason why these things are done, and the kind of benefit they give to the client. You have to be thinking. You you act on behalf of the client. Okay, so you have to position yourself like that. The contract uh, administration, all the things. What is the interest of the client? How is the client safeguarded as far as these things are uh, uh, are concerned? Okay, the quality checks and all of the uh, one also more nickel. That is where you have to be uh, uh, looking at. But chewing the thing, baba and uh, no form groups discuss, and I think you should be good. Okay. Chief examiner, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, any, any, any questions? Yeah, I think you have had a very nice uh, session. So I want to wish you all the best, OK? Uh, it is possible, OK? I'm not being political, please. Please, please. It is possible. God be with you. All right. Thank you.